So what we'll check out over the course of this video is an indefinite integral that isn't really that easy to clean up to get to the point where you're going to be able to successfully develop your antiderivative. And so the process that we're going to need within this particular integral is completing the square, which is something you've heard a little bit about in the past. Some of you probably done quite a bit with in the past, but I will have a, a link to just kind of a, a discussion on that issue, the issue of completing the square uh, in, a, in a separate video. And, and the link to that video will be in the description of this one. But if you check out this integral, the, the big issue that we have with this right here is that we have a quotient and we don't have a quotient rule for integration. Uh, we also don't have the ability to do any sort of algebra that gets rid of the quotient, the product, the outer function, inner function issue. And so there, there's not really much basic that we can do that lets us find the antiderivative of this expression. Now, what this kind of looks like to me is it's obviously a constant value in the numerator over something that's quadratic in the denominator. And so I, I kind of think, well, hey, we've got this antiderivative formula that gives us a result of inverse tangent of our variable, which is a constant in the numerator and something very, very specific that's quadratic in nature that's in the denominator. So what I'm gonna try to do over the course of the next few minutes is, is try to convince you that we can definitely get to the point where we can actually utilize this antiderivative formula to find the value or to find the antiderivative of the integrand that we see right here. And so I'm gonna basically be trying to take this and manipulate it little by little and, and make it resemble what we see sitting right here. And so if I'm going to have success with doing that, I'm gonna need there to be a one in the numerator. And that's a really, really easy issue to address. We're always able to factor constants out in front of integrals. So if I just factor a four out in front of the integral, that accomplishes what I needed to accomplish within the numerator. Now within the denominator, I've, I've kind of shuffled the order of the pieces around. So I've written the x squared piece first, the plus two x piece second. Uh, I've, I've actually kind of grouped those terms and I've left myself a little bit of space right here uh, that I'm going to use to complete the square within in just a minute. And then I've, I've kind of left the plus five outside of that quantity. And so my line of thinking is maybe I'm going to be able to put a number here that allows me to turn around and factor this expression as a perfect square trinomial. And so if I use the process of completing the square, what number would I have to put in this empty spot right here in order to create a perfect square trinomial? Well, to complete the square, I'm always going to take whatever b is, divide it by 2, and 2 divided by 2 is 1, and then square it. So I'm going to put a plus 1 in that empty spot. Now, the, the big issue here is that I cannot get away with just adding a 1 in that spot within the denominator because I've totally changed the value of the original denominator. So if I'm going to add a 1 right here, I have to do something that offsets adding 1. And so also within the denominator, I'm going to subtract 1. So I, I put a plus 1 here to complete the square, and I offset that by putting a minus 1 out here. I'm missing my differential there for some reason. Let me get that in. Sorry, it's a little sloppy when I write it in with my mouse here. And then on this next line, what I realized was, well, well, these were obviously like terms, the plus 5 and the minus 1 combined to a positive 4. But then here's the, the big benefit to doing what we just did. If we rewrite this expression inside this set of parentheses as x squared plus 2x plus 1 as its factored form, this is x plus 1 times x plus 1. So it's really x plus 1 squared. So what we now have created within that denominator is we've created one quantity being squared, which is what this antiderivative formula basically needs for us to have within one of those two positions within the denominator before we can use it. Now the issue that we still do have is that the other position within this denominator has to be a positive 1. Right now we have a positive 4 there. So we're still going to have to do something with this term right here that takes it from a 4 and turns it into a 1. So I thought, okay, check out these two terms in the denominator, the, the term that's being squared plus the 4. I can factor a 4 out of both of those. So if I factor a 4 out of 4, I'm left with the plus 1 that I need in that spot. And so that's really the reason why I've done this. Now this piece does get a little bit ugly because it's not easy to factor a 4 out of this term. But 
anytime you factor something out of a given term, you basically just divide what you started with by what you're factoring out. Factoring is like undistributing, right? So if I distributed this 4 back in, the 4 and the over 4 would cancel on this first term. We'd be left with what we see right here. And then, of course, the 4 distributed into the plus 1 gives us the plus 4 that we see we started with in that second spot. So hopefully you can convince yourself that this expression right here is equivalent to what we see in that denominator there. Another issue sneaks in. We've got this 4 within the denominator. We don't want anything except a, a 1 plus something squared within that denominator. This is an easy issue to address. I can just factor the 4 out in front of the integral. Now it is in the denominator now, so I do have to keep it in the denominator. I've already got a 4 out there from early on in the problem. And now I'm going to have an over 4 out there. So this is actually kind of nice because that's going to just reduce to a 1 in the, on the next line. But the, the new issue is this needs to be one thing being squared, not something squared divided by something else. And so I, I did one more little manipulative step here, and that was to include the 4 inside the, the quantity that was being squared within the fraction. So I realized if I square 2, I get 4. So I just kind of group this as a single fraction being squared and turn the 4 into a 2 uh, since squaring it takes it back to the 4 that we saw right there. So check out what we have here. This expression is kind of nasty, but if you let u equal this expression right here, your denominator is going to look like what we have back here. So the only issue is trying to decide what else sneaks in via the substitution sequence. And so if we let u equal what's inside this set of parentheses, you are probably going to want to think about this in a simpler form. If I take 1 x and divide by 2, I get 1 half x. And if I take 1 divided by 2, I get plus 1 half. Well, what's the derivative of u with respect to x? Well, the derivative of this is just 1 half. The derivative of this is 0. So what does dx equal? Well, multiply by the dx, multiply by the 2. This is what dx is equal to. So we've taken that integral, done quite a bit of manipulation with it, and we've turned it into this. So we can factor the 2 out in front, just like we did with the 4 and the over 4 at different points within this problem already. And then the antiderivative of 1 over u squared plus 1 is going to be inverse tangent of u. We just have to make sure we account for the 2 that we've factored out. It is an antiderivative, so we need our plus c. And then the last thing to do would be to make sure you get your original variable into your answer. And the original variable is x. So x plus 1 over 2 is what we replace the u with at the very end. And it was quite a bit of work, quite a bit of manipulation, algebra that got a little sketchy at times. Uh, but we finally developed an antiderivative for what we started with.